Psalm 23, 1 through 6. I want us to read it. And we're going to read it, but I, I want us to hear it. Perhaps like we never have before. Sometimes we can become kind of familiar with some scriptures that we've heard a lot. And I want you to, as I have done, this week I have done this and I have discovered some unbelievable feelings and worship and times of refreshing over the word of God in this very familiar passage that we all love. So listen to it like you've never heard it before. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Say the last verse with me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of the Lord that is here with us. We ask you now to take the word that you have given and and I believe the word that, God, you have for our church, even on such a day as this. I pray that you would comfort and bring peace, bring restoration to the people who have gathered here in your name, those who are gathering with us online. Touch them today and minister to us all. And Lord, if there is anyone here that does not know you as Savior and Lord, my heart is that they will come to know you in this very hour. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to see Sister Pitts. Sister Pitts, I was on in the Caribbean Ocean, and I got word that you were in the hospital. So I'm glad to see you this morning. Caribbean didn't keep me from praying for you. And I'm glad to see you here today. Amen. So what is, uh, let, let's, let's talk about favorite scriptures. W what is your favorite scriptures? Which, I mean, I, I'm not asking for you to like call them out or anything. That might take all day. But we have those that are our favorite scriptures. The, the ones that are the most sought after. The ones we look for. We go on Google and we search for the meanings of them. Well, I wanted to find out what is the top five scripture passages that people search for, and I'm, I love to go find those things, and I found the number one scripture that people in the world search for on Google is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Guess you can't, I bet you can't guess what the second most searched scripture is in the world. Well, I'll tell you. It's Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts, the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now, there's another one. The third highest ranking scripture that is searched for in Google is Philippians 4.13. I know Brian, Pastor, Pastor Brian, Coach Brian knows. He's also a pastor to those young people. I thank you for that. But I know you know this one. You called it the 10-finger prayer. It's, I can do 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The la- uh, not the last one. The fourth one that I found uh, is John 10 and 10. We know this one. For the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, to bring life and life more abundantly. Lastly, the top scripture, the top five in the world is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. How many of you know we can trust the Word of God? Amen. We can trust the Word of God. It doesn't always fit into our our desires, our wants, our preferences. It doesn't always fit in with what we think the plan ought to be. But I have come to find out in all these many years. Thanks for the smiles. I appreciate it. I've come to understand in all these years that I can trust him. That I can trust him. And so as we look at this scripture today and we're in this restoration project this is an important time first of all can I just say thank you Pastor Richard for this wonderful set design doesn't that look great he did so good amen he did great Uh, so thankful for him and his creativity he went and found all this and put it all together and that car up there I don't know how we drove that in here but um Whatever you do, don't go up there and look too closely. Because everything is not always as it seems. But I also wanted to thank Pastor Debbie and Pastor Luke. Didn't they do a great job preaching while I was gone? I was ministered to in the middle of the Caribbean Ocean. (laughs) But I was ministered to and my heart was touched and I was so thankful that they had such a great word for our church. In the lobby, you'll notice there are a couple of restoration projects. I wanted to share very quickly that those those two projects that we have going over the next several weeks, you're going to see the process of restoration. And one is you're going to see that piano out there. Now that is not just a piano we found at the Goodwill. That is the piano. That is over, it's over 110 years old. It is definitely at least 107 years old because that was the piano sitting on the front porch in Auburn, on Auburn Street in Middletown in 1915 when our church was being formed by a small little Bible study. So that is the piano that was owned by the Morrison family. They would roll that baby out on the porch And they'd sing and bring down the house, and then they'd roll it right back in. And now here it is, 107 years later, it's sitting right out there. And we have the idea to restore it back to its original beauty, because we're in a restoration project. So I'm excited to see what that's going to look like. Also, if you'll notice, you go down in the lobby over towards the hub, you'll see there's a pew sitting on a platform. That pew belonged to the Clayton Street Church of God. So there were many of uh, your grandparents that used those pews, that sat on those pews, that prayed on those pews, and heard a lot of preaching in its day. So that, that, uh, it's a smaller pew, but that's because it was a long one originally, and they had to cut off some of the pew that was damaged uh, through a, a roof leak at the uh, old building. But we got that, we got this one. And we're going to restore it back to its original beauty and make it better. Because that's what's so cool about restoration. Have you ever seen them, them classic cars? Man, they, they didn't look like that in 1950. They weren't that shiny. They didn't even have the, the gloss that we have these days. But, man, you can see some of them classic cars. I know a 57 Chevy that I love real well. Mike, raise your hand real big. Mike is now the proud owner of his dad, Orville Robinson's 57 Chevy. Black with chrome, silver everywhere. It was beautiful. 
I used to like kid Orville all the time that he better keep that under lock and key. Because if I ever find the key, I'm going to drive it away. <laughs> beautiful car. It looks way more beautiful, I think, than it ever did in the beginning. It's been restored. It's beautiful. And that's what this whole restoration is about. It's about God coming down in the middle of our lives and, and bringing a restoration to us. And I want to understand exactly what that means. And boy, Pastor Debbie and Pastor Luke, they helped us in so many ways. I loved, you know, their illustrations. I loved the word. I loved the preaching. But I, I look at where we are today and I, I, I think sometimes Scripture needs to be restored in us. Because as I mentioned, these familiar passages of Scripture, these kind of famous Scriptures that everybody wants to know the meaning of, sometimes we, we have problems with Scriptures because they become too familiar to us. They become kind of comfortable and they lose their wonder. They lose their inspiration, even their infallibility. And maybe... They even lose their true meaning because we've let them become so cliche. Now, I looked up the word cliche so I'd know how I was using the word I could, I could defend. And I don't know why I always go back to my Tennessee roots when I talk like this, but the word cliche means a phrase or opinion that is overused and it betrays the original thought. Hmm. Interesting. A cliche. Sometimes we find ourselves looking for a new word. We want something else. We don't want to just quote Jeremiah 29 11. For I know the plans that he has for me. He has plans to prosper me and to give me health and to give me hope and give me a future. Depending on what version you're reading. We want something new. We want something different. When actually, if we would stop Jackie long enough to really look at that scripture and analyze the words that are being used there, it's enough. It's more than enough. The word of God is more than enough. He gives us hope in every earthly situation. It, it doesn't always feel like it, especially on a day like today. You know, we can, we can feel the heaviness, and we should. There's, there's mourning, there's grieving that happens. This family, we understand, our church family, we get it. We understand and know that the heartache and the heartbreak is here for you, for them, for all of us who have lost loved ones. I've lost, you've lost. Sometimes we need to stop just long enough to remember that God has a word. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a promise for every season of our lives. I have found the word of God to have the answers to all of my life. When I walk away from the hospital, when I walk away from the cemetery, when I walk away from trouble and trials, God, He has an answer. He has an answer. Sometimes we've heard these scriptures so much in our lives that they become, as I said, too familiar. Sometimes we need to slow down and even stop long enough to read them one line at a time, one word at a time, and ask ourselves, what does this mean? I mean, have you ever wondered when it says, my God is a, is a refuge and a fortress, a high tower. Do you ever stop and, and think, what does that mean to my life? He's a covert from the storm. He rebukes the devourer. Do you ever look at those scriptures and, and want to go deeper? Want to find out a little bit more about what they mean? How they affect us? How they touch our lives today? I do. I do all the time. And I have. With the scripture passage that we have now during our restoration project. And it's simple words. It's only four little words in verse 3 
of Psalm 23. And it simply says this, He restores my soul. What does that mean? What does that look like? How many have just overlooked that line and read through it? We say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy. We look at that one line, verse 3, I get a picture. The Lord is my shepherd. I see Jesus with a shepherd's staff. I see him with the white sash. And I see him with a head covering. And he's, he's walking in a field or he's reaching down for a, a sheep. I see that picture. The Lord is my shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I see it. I see the green, lush grasses that the sheep eat and and how they want to lay it down in the soft grass and and, and rest. I get it. I see it. He will be a comfort. He will make sure my needs are taken care of. He'll feed me. This This is beautiful. Like a shepherd, he'll make sure he leads me to those green grasses and those meadows. He leads me beside the still waters. I see it. I can see all the way into the pond and the the sheep that are getting the drink. They're thirsty. They're parched. They're in the desert and they found water. I get it. He's a shepherd that will make sure we hunger and thirst no more. Wonderful. I see it. And then I get to verse 3. He restores my soul. I have no picture. I don't know what that looks like in respect to the shepherd. So I skip it. And I go back to, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He, or he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Then it goes on. I skip over that. You know what I found out? I found out that the commentary, commentaries that I looked at, several of them in a, in a, in a row... They all skip over that, that one line. It's like they're sharing with me the shepherd motif, the share, shepherd mentality behind every verse. And they get to, it says, he restores my soul. And they just kind of let that be there. And I'm like, no, God, I want to know what does that mean? You're, you're making reference to this. David is making reference. He was a shepherd. He understands how a shepherd works. He, he's saying, my Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. So he's making this comparison. So what does that mean? He restores my soul. Well, I kept reading and I kept going. I left the sheep there by the still waters and I just kept trying to figure it out. I was wondering, how do you find the answer? And I decided to go on a search, and I looked all over the Bible, different places, Old Testament, New Testament, places where you can find Scripture on the shepherd. And of course, we go to the most obvious, when Jesus himself describes in John 10, he talks about the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. And he talks about what it means to be a good shepherd talks about how he'll leave, a good shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the one. He makes sure that the 99 are on the hill and they're safe. And then he goes and looks for the one. That's awesome. That's a good shepherd. He he, he lets us know that a good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. Okay, I'm seeing that picture. I'm, I'm understanding what a good shepherd is. But I found out that if you do more searches, you find that there are places that will describe what a good shepherd is not. And that perhaps Jesus was even using Ezekiel 34 as a reference 
for what a good shepherd is not. Listen. Got to go ahead. Here we are. The prophet Ezekiel. Son of man, God said, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. Then we jump down to verse 11. It says, For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself, he says, will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I. I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I, verse 14, I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. When he looks at us, and he reads, when I, when I believe Jesus was speaking about the good shepherd, he was making reference to this word of God. And he was coming back. He, you know, the Bible says he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All throughout, wherever he talks about a good shepherd, it's because of the bad shepherd. And when we look at these bad shepherds and we see that God now steps in and he becomes the good shepherd, now we understand a little bit more about Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters and he restores my soul. What does it mean? The picture is this. You see the shepherd leaving the 99. You see him going to the broken, going to the hurting, going to the lost and the one that has strayed away. You see that he's going after in a continual restoration process. He's constantly working in the present tense. How many times have you failed God, but when you got down on your knees and you gave your heart back to him and you repented to him, how many of you found he was right there, right where you left him the whole time? God always shows up. Jesus said, anyone who doesn't come this way is a hireling. Anyone who doesn't come through the door, which he says, I'm the door. Then he goes on in John 10, 10, you know, he says, the hireling is a thief and a robber. He says, that thief, he comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. He says, but I've come to give life and life more abundant. Do you know what the very next verse is? The very next verse is, I am the good shepherd. And I give my life for the sheep. Wow. Now, I don't know, maybe that don't bless you like it does me, but I'm sitting there going, Lord, I now see it. I see restoration now. It's all right in the middle of our project. It is right what we're talking about. He wants to restore, just like that 57. He wants to restore us back to an original state better than it ever could have been before. He wants to take the lost, the hurting, the broken. You see, you and I, we are sheepish. Why do you think he compares us to sheep? Because sheep are dumb. Sheep are dumb. 
They get up, they wander around, they don't, they don't pay no attention. They got to have a shepherd. They got to have a shepherd with a rod. And they got to be kind of led along. He takes that hook. Come on, baby. Get over here with the flock. He takes it. Sometimes it's got to be a rod. Sometimes it's got to be comfort. Sometimes it rescues them. Sometimes that rod punishes them. Whatever it does, it's leading them. Beside the still waters, leading them, teaching them how to walk in righteousness. He's doing all of these things and he's using the shepherd motif to let us know that this is the kingdom of God and how God works. But we look at it. We look at it and we say, sheep have to have a shepherd. Think about all the other animals in the kingdom of animals. You don't see dogs all going around in a flock. I mean, unless they're bad dogs. But most dogs just sit on the front porch and wait for somebody to throw them a biscuit. Dogs don't travel in, in, in herds and flocks. Sheep do. But sheep, sheep can't, they, they, they can't go on their own. They, they have to have a shepherd. They even have sheep dogs because the sheep got it. They got to be kept. You leave a sheep to itself and it'll wander off and get lost, fall off a cliff and die. Kind of like us. If you ever wondered, I also find it interesting that sheep have to have shepherds. I've never seen cows. There's nobody, nobody has a, a cow shepherd. Nobody has a pig shepherd. There's no such thing as a cat shepherd. Lord, have mercy. Cats will never need a shepherd. Unless they're going to eat one. <laughs> but you, no other animal's got to have a shepherd. So God in his word, he makes reference to sheep, that we are like sheep. You think they're cute, but really they're dumb. They go off, they get lost, they get hurt, they get wounded. If they turn over, they're so fat and heavy that their skinny little rod legs can't even get them back over. The shepherd's got to be there to pick them back up and turn them over. God says, I, you're like sheep. And even though he leads us, he leads us by the waters. He leads us in the green grasses. He teaches us, leads us in righteousness to teach us to walk. And he prepares a table in front of our enemies. He, he anoints our head with oil. He does all of these things and makes a promise that we will live in the house of the Lord forever. These are wonderful things the shepherd does. There's just this one place where God recognizes that we're sheep, that we are real sheep, and that we are sheepish. I'm trying to think of other words for sheep. Did you know that the word sheep is not singular, it's plural, but it represents one sheep or many sheep. You have five sheep, you don't say there's sheepies. <laughs> there's sheep. There's some sheep. I thought, well, if there's just one, you can't call him a sheep, so I thought I'd call him a shep. But that don't work either. They're sheep. That's a little clue for us. There's a godly clue right there. I'm going to give it to you, and it's awesome. And I'm, I'm as good as Jensen Franklin on this one. He gave us the example of the shepherd with the sheep, making sure we understand that we're never just one. We're always we. We're always sheep. We're all, we do life together. All throughout the word, that's why we do life together. Because we're sheep. We're plural. We're a body. We're many members. We need one another. We are here for one another. Elaine's family will not go without all of us being as close as we can be in their time of need. This is what the body of Christ does. Jesus he made reference to that sheep and how they need restoration. Now when I see 
he restores my soul. I'm like, oh, so now he's leading. He leads me here and he leads me there and he teaches me here and he sets me a table here and he does all of these wonderful things and at the end of it all, a promise that I will always dwell in the safety of his house. But there's this one verse where he makes mention of the fact that we sometimes get up and go away. We sometimes mess up, make bad choices. We sometimes find ourselves straying or broken or wounded. Maybe we've been attacked and he's made provision in his system of shepherding for restoration. It's part of the plan. It's part of the plan. It's part of his love. It's part of who he is. He's the shepherd. It's Isaiah 61. For the, Lord, for the Spirit of the Lord is on me and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To bind up those that are wounded and broken and to set the captives free. Open up the prison doors. Open the blinded eyes. This is the good shepherd. He comes along to help us. Yes, he saves our soul. But he goes beyond that. He leads us, guides us, helps us with our hunger and our thirst. And then he even is there. That little verse 3. He restores my soul. Do you know what the word restores means in the Hebrew? I'm glad you asked. Let me share it with you. It's a word. It's a word called shub. Everybody say shub. Shub. Shub nefesh. So the four words in Hebrew now become only two words. Uh, four words in English become two words in Hebrew. Shub nefresh. And when you look at that one word, and I've done a lot of searches in my life, but when I started looking for what does the Hebrew word shub mean in the scripture, this is what I found. To turn back, literally or figuratively, with not the idea of returning to the starting point, a retreat to its original state, but better. To break, to build, to dig, to do anything to help. Feed, lay down, lodge, make, rejoice, sin, take, weep. Cause to answer, cause to bring back again, home again. To call to mind, to carry again, to convert, to deliver, to draw back, to fetch. Are you hearing me? Pull in again, recall, recompense, recover, refresh, relieve, render again, requit, rescue, restore, retrieve. Cause to make, to return, and to say nay, send back, take back, and turn again. One word that means all that. So it shows me a picture now of the Savior reaching into the thicket, reaching over the cliff, reaching in to the bushes where the sheep has been lost couldn't find its way back. And that one little word, two words Hebrew, four words English, he restores my soul. It shows that God has a system and a love and a heart for us as we journey. So it's important that you understand his love. So many folks today try to make God so harsh, make him so difficult. Trust me, the word of God is clear to outline holiness and righteousness in Christ. We are imputed righteousness from Jesus. I get that. These are important things for us to understand. He demands that we live a, a separated, sanctified, holy life. But I, the thing that we miss sometimes is that he's right there saying, come on, baby. Come on, take a step this way. Come on, you, you're in the wrong area. He goes and he finds you and he pulls you back out and he brings you back into a place where he wants you to understand he's ready to restore. I've never, ever seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his hand against a child of God. I have found that he is there when true repentance and brokenness in heart comes to our hearts and minds, 
God always meets us right there. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will go with you all the way to the end. That's what he restores my soul means. And that's the picture that I get in my, in my head. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. He says in verse 12, what do you think? In Matthew 18. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not stray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He binds up our wounds. He heals our sicknesses. He takes, he gives us joy in the morning for the night of weeping. He gives us joy in the morning for the night of weeping. He says in his word, he turns our mourning into dancing. He removes the sackcloth of heaviness from our lives and replaces it with garments of praise. He puts on us a robe of gladness. Cindy, I know she was your best friend. You two were like two peas in a pod. See one, see the other. And if you didn't, it's because you was with your husbands. You're going to laugh again. You're going to dance again. And you're going to be fired up with faith again. Because he will not fail you. He's going to restore what has been broken. Your heart. He's going to restore that. He's going to touch this family going to touch you, Gage. He's going to be with you. You asked me the other night, am I going to be okay? And I said, yes, you are. You're going to be okay. Because he is the restorer. He puts us back together better. Would you stand with me this morning? Remember what I said, it's, we're sheep, we're not Shep. Look at somebody and call them a sheep. We do life, we do life together. We share our burdens, we pray for one another. I call it, are you ready, here's a new terminology. I call it flock work. It's flock work. Brother Don, we have to, we have to care about one another, and lift one another up. When one is down, we come alongside and lift up their arms. It's flock work. At some point in our lives, every single one of us, listen closely. Brother Gary, every one of us, at one point or another in our lives, we're going to need verse 4. Or, I'm sorry, verse 3. We're going to need his restoration, Jamie. We're going to need it. You're going to need it. I'm going to need it. RJ, he restores my soul. You're going to need verse 3. I know we're used to kind of glossing over that one and getting past that one because we couldn't picture it but now you will you'll see a wounded bleeding broken some of you you've been broken and you healed wrong because this, you didn't give it to the shepherd you healed wrong you know how like I've got a finger here that I didn't do anything right when I messed it up years ago and so now it's a little crooked I ain't showing you it healed wrong some of you in here and I feel the Holy Spirit right now some of you 
you've healed wrong. And you're in your spirit and in your emotions, you're, you're wounded. And it, you're healed, but you healed wrong. You're angry, you're bitter, you're upset, you're unforgiving, or you're just you're crippled in your emotions. You healed wrong, but He's the restorer. He's going to restore you. He's going to touch your life. I believe with all my heart, I, I've been so excited about this series because this is the real ministry, Mike. Mike and I have been talking. We're going to be sharing some stuff with you as a church. We've got some crazy, ridiculous, reckless ideas for ministry that we believe with all of our heart God has, God has brought us all together for. And that includes flock work. We're going to live to be exactly what Jesus wanted us to be and that's the answer to the problems in the world we're going to be the answer not in ourselves we're, you see the sheep the sheep get rescued get in the flock and then they, they help keep all the other sheep that's why they travel like they do they, they keep the sheep in line they, keep, they do it too we got to take care of one another Make sure that nobody gets off track and wanders off. Don't wander off because we're coming after you. God's coming after you. The shepherd. And I know he's going to heal some people in here today. He's going to touch your heart. I want you to step out from where you are. Meet me in the altars if you would. As many as will. In just the few moments that we have, would you please come and bring that brokenness bring those things that are hidden inside verse 3 what's in verse 3 everything that needs restored relationships your heart your brokenness, your sadness, your grief it's in verse 3 oh I feel God I feel that there's a canopy over this place and God is going to do something amazing I, I can't do it I could come over and lay hands on you and you know that might get me punched but when the Holy Spirit touches you For I speak to you by my spirit. I am indeed that good shepherd. I am here to be a balm in Gilead for the wounding and the hurt in your life. It is not my will that you carry these things. It is not my heart that you would transgress those areas of your life over and over again with no healing. I am here to restore Touch the hem of my garment by faith and know that I will do it, says the Lord. I am mighty. I will heal. I will make the crooked places straight. I will provide. I am a perimeter of safety for you. You may trust in me. Hallelujah. He was there. Would you very politely, while Gary's singing, would you just put one hand on someone's shoulder standing there in front of you and just make a contact with someone? We pray in agreement here today for restoration. Lord, for you to restore your people. God, we bring to you every hurt, we bring every wound, we bring those things that, Lord, where we have went astray and we've gotten lost in our way, we come back to you today and we return. We ask you, Lord, restore. Be that good shepherd in our hearts and lives. We thank you. You have, you have led us. 
You've led us in those green pastures. We've been there. You've led us to the waters and we've drank and we're thankful. But Lord, we need restored. We've gone astray and we're so thankful today that we have learned and we understand from your word that God, you've got provision for us. You've got a purpose for us. And Lord, when we fall, falter in our faith, you have a restoration system. You are the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go searching after the one that is lost. Oh, help us today, God, to grab hold of this truth. For the enemy would not want us to get it. He wouldn't want us to embrace it. For Lord, he loves to keep us in condemnation. He loves to keep us wrapped up in guilt and suffocated by our own shame. But oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, let the eyes be opened in this place. and Let the power of the Holy Spirit open every prison door and every heart that needs wounds healed and bind together Lord let it be let it be let it happen Lord even in this very moment we pray over this house and we pray over every man woman boy and girl lifting up your name and asking you to do and perform the work of restoration let us leave this house lighter than we've ever been in so long help us God to walk out of here free in the name of Jesus free from those things that we've hidden, those things that we've kept quiet, those things that we thought we just got to live with and we will never be free from them. Oh, restore, good shepherd, restore. Restore your people today, God, in the name of Jesus. As you're praying for one another, Pray the power of freedom. Pray the power of the good shepherd to restore over their lives. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. With every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Are you here today and you feel like you've never really made him your shepherd? You Maybe you've gotten away and you need Him. You need Him to be Lord of your life. I would pray a prayer with you today to, to be restored in your relationship with Jesus. I want that for you. and I believe that's why you're here. So if you would pray that prayer with us to just be right with God, to make Him your shepherd, to make Him your Savior. And you're ready to do that. Would you just slip up your hand and write back down? Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? I want in on that prayer, Pastor. I want to be in. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I see you. Praise God for these hands. These these sheep. These sheep that are coming back home. We honor you. Let's pray together, folks. Lord Jesus. Good shepherd, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I accept you as my Savior. Please be Lord of my life. You are the Son of God. You died on a cross for me. You rose from the dead. You walked out of the tomb. Now walk into my life. I make you Lord. I make you shepherd. And I believe, therefore your word says, that as I confess you now, I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer with us, you'll see up on the screen there behind me. Set free to 97000. Please take a moment. Just text that number and put in the text set free. And we're going to be in contact with you. We're going to make sure you get a Bible. We're going to give you some information. Help you with your new walk with Christ and how to get established. And we're going to be there for you in any way that we can. God bless you today.